when the warm-up is complete, the spindle will be turned off and you will see that you have a return to the main interface here. Currently, the tool in use is still the tool used for the uh, recently finished warm-up. And since we want to calibrate tool, tools 1 through 3, we can optionally, this will be done automatically when calibrating, example I got set tool number 1, but we can already at this stage return tool number 4 to its to its tool holder. We do this with the CNC controller. We press menu. We press either you uh, go one step at a time with these, but you can also go furthest down visible option in the list by pressing this Z button here. You go down to ATC or automatic tool change, press N to confirm. And you can go down here to tool unload option, press N to confirm. And you can click 1 to unload now. Then it will return tool number 4 to tool holder 4. And return to its previous position. Alright. We can press cancel consecutively here. Cancel, cancel. And we're back to the main interface. What we want to do now is to calibrate all three tools. And we do this in the same menu actually, go to menu and go down to ATC, automatic tool change. And then you go up to calibrate tool up here, press enter to confirm. And then you enter what tool number you want to calibrate. In this case we want to start with number 1 and then go 2 and then 3. So having the default value at 1 we can simply press enter or click 1 and enter to confirm. It will move to tool holder 1 and fetch tool number 1. And it will position itself above the metal plate that is used for calibrating the length of the tool. The length of the tool is calibrated by the CNC machine knowing at what height, at what set value, there is a short circuit, a control short circuit of this, only to find out the height of the z-axis when the tip of the current tool touches the metal plate while having a magnet attached to the tool so as to allow the short circuits to be short circuited. We can fetch this controller and move with it further down, but not further down than the cable allows and generally for the x x positive direction x negative direction y positive direction y negative direction it's easier if you have the cnc controller in a way like this just so you know that if you want to jog positive x then that's that way negative x that's that way positive y, that's that way, and negative y, that's that way. The z axis there is often not much confusion about. Alright, before calibrating the tool we need to make sure that the magnet is properly attached to the tool so as to allow the short circuit to happen. And the magnet is here on top of the CNC machine. The magnet that we're going to use is this small one. Be very careful about it when you handle it so it does not break. Position it on the nut of the tool, like this. You see that it properly fastened on the metal of the tool's nut here. And since it's metal, 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 metal for the nut, the shock, the collet and the, and the rudder bits, there's going to be a short circuit as, as soon as the tip of the tool touches this, the surface of the plate here. All right, having verified, so the magnet is properly attached to the tool, we can go back to the CNC controller. And you remember here, we have already entered the calibration tool, uh, the calibration interface here. So we're going to make sure here that if we want to jog, if we want to fine tune the position of the spindle so as to make sure that the tool is um, above a certain point on the plate there, 
we can jog with these uh, with these four in X and Y. So I can show that here. So we'll jog a little to the right here. You sort of move, and we can jog a little closer to us here. Very good. And while fine tuning this. So that you see that, uh, and you actually, in, in most cases, you don't need to fine tune this. It's at the, uh, the point that the tool travels to when it calibrates, when it's in calibration mode. It's actually very good, but sometimes there are uh, source of collisions on that partic particular point, and you can move a little more to the center of it, of the plate. We can see here that. Now it's a little too close to us, since we jog close, so we'll jog a little uh, away from us, like that. It looks better, and regarding this position, it looks okay. Alright, and uh, first, uh, when you're actually intending to make contact between the tool and the plate here, you should be moving at the utmost slowest speed possible and you do that by holding the zero you see here that zero is auto set and that is when you hold down the zero key here but before doing that to save us some time we can move in the set axis down so we are about uh, three large fingers above the plate here so we can very carefully jog down with the set key here let's see if we can show Okay, not now, but uh, I'll jog down a little with the Z key here. And then now, perhaps you can see, yeah. And then we jog down very carefully in small steps. Until we're about three fingers above here. I'll position this cable so as not to be in, in the way here. Yeah, we can do a little more, so just Slightly pressing the Z key here, set down. I think that's really good. Okay, so from this position we can also more closely evaluate the position of it. We can move actually a little closer here by jogging like that. And now uh, with this distance we are ready to simply hold down zero. So we'll hold down zero. And now it says here, calibrating two, hold zero to move down. And we are holding zero. And it slowly, slowly moves. And here, here is your last chance to uh, also visually check that the magnet is still in place. If the magnet is not in place, it will collide with the plate. But if it is properly in place, it will be properly calibrated. Very good. And now, uh, it might be tempting to, uh, to select the other tool immediately. Uh, but you, just, just, you should make sure now as to remove the magnet. Having calibrated tool number one, having removed the magnet, now we can press two here. The next tool number to calibrate is two. And click enter to confirm. Because now it will leave tool number one in tool holder one. And fetch tool two in tool holder two. Alright, and now we place the magnet again on the nut here, very good, and uh, we are welcomed by the same interface here, so we can jog down until we have this distance or so, so jog down with Z, round there, yeah, somewhere around there. And we can jog a little to the right from this point of view and a little perhaps closer to us and a little more to the right perhaps yep it's pretty centered and from this position we can hold down zero visually make it oh now we can actually physically make sure that this is properly attached position this so that it does not make a tension and then we can click and hold zero and you see that it's calibrating too Hold zero to move down. It moves down.
and it is calibrated. Very good. And now we can take off the magnet here, carefully. And then we can click 3 here to enter 2 number to calibrate, 3. Press enter to confirm. It will leave tool number 2 in tool holder 2. And fetch tool number 3 in tool holder 3. We attach the magnet to this tool on the nut here. Make sure that it is in a proper place. Very good. We can jog down, jog down in z-axis, so that we are about three fingers here. And jog a little to the right, and a little in front, to close to us. Very good, we can actually, for this we can have a little lower, like that. All right. And then we can hold the zero key to calibrate the tool. Auto setting. Visually checking that the magnet is still in place. Very good. All three tools are calibrated. Remove the magnet and position it on top of the CNC machine here. And having already calibrated all three tools that we intend to use, we can click cancel. And that will exit the calibration interface here. Cancel. It moves. And now, since we still are in this automatic tool change interface here, in the menu options for the automatic tool change plugin, it is advisable to change the tool to tool number one. Because in succeeding steps now, we are going to calibrate the top surface of the material stock. And the first tool that is actually going to engage with the material stock is tool number one. So even though having calibrated all three of these tools, the length of these tools, even though the CMC machine uh, uses the different lengths of these tools, to properly know at what Z height it should operate during the different tool paths, it is a sound thing to change the tool to tool number one when setting the surface and setting the maximum depth and making sure that the calibrations in relation to the stock surface is made with the first tool that is engaging with the material. So we can go down here to get tool and press enter and then we can choose, instead of 3 here, we can change it to 1. And having set 1, we can click enter to confirm. This will, um, this will leave tool holder 3, this will leave tool number 3 in the tool holder 3, and it will set tool 1 from the tool holder 1. Very good. And now, having done so, we can cancel out and exit this menu. So cancel and cancel. And now we're at the main interface. We can move this back to its position here. With all three tools properly calibrated, it is time to position your material stock. So here we have the material stock. It should be placed right here. If your material stock should be, or must be of course, situated above at least one vacuum inlet. That is to make sure that you, with vacuum sealing strips, can seal off an area that is available for suction, and that is uh, uh, without leaks, to make sure that the material is properly attached to the machine bed. Otherwise, you cannot have a secure cut. That is the reason why you cannot cut, cut anything uh, less than 78 times 78 in uh, millimeters X and Y, uh, because then you simply cannot attach it properly 
over at least uh, over the minimum area of one vacuum inlet. But for this particular stock dimensions, we can only use one vacuum inlet, but that is sufficient given that we seal it off proper enough. So we can actually uh, just um, eyeballing it here, looking at this vacuum inlet, seeing that it is centered here, and then we position it, the, set, the setup that is, roughly above it, roughly so that the center of the setup, the center of the stock, is roughly uh, where the center of the vacuum inlet is. And having done so, we go to the tool table, where there are four small strips of vacuum sealing strips here. So I'll take all four of these. And then we can use these four so as to uh, pinpoint the extents of a possible vacuum sealing strip or of a possible vacuum sealing strip placement. So uh, perhaps uh, one of these boxes is enough for this to be good. Uh, this, is, this vacuum sealing strip should, no, should not uh, be placed at the actual edge. They should be inset by a margin of at least one box, one of these boxes. So perhaps there, and here we can have perhaps there, and here. And now with these placed, we can shift the material to the side and see if this was good. So this would mean that it's there and there, going there and oh and there. Yeah, and I, I think that's that's pretty much centered. It does not it does not need it does not need to be perfectly on center. But the main thing is that here is where the suction is going to be spread from and we want to seal off an area that is as centered as possible given the inlet that we use. All right, so uh, with that done, we can take these four as our guides and we can fetch the large box with vacuum sealing strips. And looking here, we see if we can find one of sufficient length, but that is not too long. If it's too long, that simply means there's uh, an excess of work to properly fixate it in the ditches or trenches here but I think that this is fair this is fair enough we'll try this one I'll use both my hands Very good, and in a corner where two ends of the strips meet, make sure that the short end is on the interior side and that the long end is extending outside of it. Right, and making sure, making sure that it's positioned correctly, each corner aligned to what we intended, and we can see that this is slightly off center. This should, uh, or like, if we had moved this a little to the left here, it would have been more centered, but it's still adequate enough. We can remove these four: one, two, three, four, and return them to the toolbox here. Very good. 
And now, having made secure that the vacuum sealing strips are properly inset into the ditches here, or the trenches, we can return the vacuum sealing box here and then position the material above the vacuum sealing strip here. Very good. And the next step is to, uh, actually that was a previous step, but make sure that you orient, that you orientate your stock so that it is 100% corresponding with this orientation that you have decided upon in Rhino and in Fusion 360. Uh, so in this case, the long axis is along the X axis of the machine bed and the short axis of the setup stock is along the short axis, the Y axis of the machine bed. Uh, that is something that you must uh, make sure of before uh, placing the vacuum sealing strip, of course. Make sure that the stock is oriented in the same way as you have previously done in the CAM software. Alright, the next thing is to make sure that it is properly, not only rotated generally, but actually rotated in terms of fine tuning. So if you gently, gently, this is one thing, if you push, uh, if you push a material, uh, the vacuum sealing strips might be dislocating themselves. So it is a better idea to adjust the movement by uh, extending or by lifting it a little and then positioning it and then like this. That makes the movements less susceptible to making this. I can demonstrate here. If I slide this over here, then the whole vacuum sealing strip ejected from the trench here. That is something to avoid. You, you always double check that, of course, if there is no bulging that is uh, placed immediately above the machine bed. All right. I would say that this is orthogonal. Given that this line, I, oh, actually, we can we can move this a little bit. Very good. Now I will say that the stock is is situated orthogonally, since this x-axis is co-aligned to the x-axis of the machine bed. And we lift, uh, we lift the stock to make sure that no vacuum sealing strip uh, is uh, ejected from the trench. And then make sure that the x-axis in this case is still oriented correctly, rotated correctly. Very good. Because no matter how you rotate your stock material, the toolpath will be executed strictly orthogonally. So should this, uh, uh, should this uh, stock be slightly skewed, then the cut will also be relatively skewed because it will still be orthogonal while your stock is slightly rotated. So make sure that it is rotated uh, 90 degrees orthogonally and that it is correctly oriented. So that in this case, the long axis is along the x-axis as in Fusion 360, as in Rhino, and the short axis the same. When you are satisfied with the placement of the stock, it is time to turn on the vacuum. Why we do this at such an early, at such an early stage is because the actual height of the set of stock will differ. Like you see here, there is slight movement in the z-axis due to the vacuum sealing strips. 
and we need to make sure that the vacuum is on so that the surface that we calibrate, the top surface that we set for the tool path to execute as the set zero from, is the same as the one that we're actually running. And we, of course, run the tool path with the vacuum, with the vacuum suction on, so we turn it on already at this stage. We go back to this door here, or to this room here. And here we have already made sure that the oil levels are correct, so we can simply turn it on here. It's very noisy. And since it is noisy, we can close this door. Since the vacuum uh, machine is uh, noisy, we can close this door as of now. But when actually milling, when during the operation, it is very good if this is open, at least slightly. Because if there is a smoldering fire developing underneath the material, then since, this is a, since the uh, material is secured with uh, a vacuum suction, then that smoldering fire, that the smoke of the smoldering fire, will not be visible from the top or from the outside here, but it will be visible as smoke that travels down the vacuum and inside the vacuum machine. So if this door is closed during operation, you will not be aware of it until it's too late, but it's a good thing that it's open during operation. We can close it now. And having turned the vacuum machine on, nothing has, nothing extraordinary has happened here, because it's, uh, where the vacuum suction is active depends on which of these valves we turn on. And as you see here, they all have different zones. So this one with the circle at the far left of it is the two vacuum inlets over there. This one at the lower left is the two here. And this one on the lower right here is the one that we're actually using, as well as another one there. And the fourth one, the same here, up there, the third, that one there. All right, this highlights something very important, that before we turn on this valve, so as to enable the vacuum suction for these two, for these two inlets for this area, it is important to make sure that the uh, since this inlet is also going to be active, it's very important that this is not uh, an MDF blocker because an MDF blocker, an MDF, MDF is a very porous material, so it still le lets uh, air through. So we make sure that it's either one of these rubber ones or it's uh, one of those uh, metal ones. So the rubber one is good, and uh, these MDF ones, uh, why they are here is because uh, we lack a number of these, as well as the metal ones. Uh, these are perfectly adequate for use with the other vacuum, uh, vacuum suction areas, or the, yeah, the vacuum uh, suction sections here, because they, their primary use is only to make sure that no material is sucked into the vacuum machine. Uh, and for that purpose, MDF is perfectly valid. But for the inlets that we're at, for the other inlets that we're actually going to activate the sections for, it's really important that it's rubber or metal. So having done that, we can uh, we can uh, push this um, push this valve upwards, and doing so, we see or perhaps we didn't see but I can assure you that the material uh, got sucked down. Previously it uh, wobbled a little, but now it is dead set on the machine bed here. Having fully, uh, fully activated this uh, section of the, vacuum, vacuum, of the vacuum bed, we also can make sure that it does not uh, uh, move at all. Like if we push, uh, I push it, all I have, that's all the strength I have, it's immovable. Uh, that's demonstrating the power of the vacuum here. Uh, I'll try here as well. No, even when I try to move it with all my strength and uh, uh, help and uh, guided by, with the help from the wall there, I could not uh, even, I could not even uh, make it move uh, half a millimeter. Very good, that makes it uh, very securely attached to the machine bed.
and that we're ready to set the surface. To set the surface, or calibrate the work origin Z0, we go to the CNC controller here, and even though we could actually enable the command already, uh, we have, uh, it's much more sound to first jog the tool so that it is positioned above the stock. So we'll do that, we'll jog here, I'll jog here towards us in the x-direction, towards us in the x-direction. Having made sure also that this tool number one, or the, the first tool, that's the first tool part we use, that we're using. And we jog a little to the left here, y positive. And now, having positioned the tool above the surface of the stock here, we go up here and take this one, this metal plate, and position it underneath. We will uh, find uh, tune uh, the location of it uh, when it's in close proximity. We'll take the magnets that we previously know for the, from the tool calibration, and we place it in the same position here, on the nut. Alright, we can jog down with Z a little, perhaps so, make sure that the cables do not intertangle, and position this in a good way, making sure that it's roughly underneath, very good. And then we can jog Z so that we have three uh, fat fingers over. Up there, a little more. Very good. So now you can find the position of this metal plate. Very good. And now, having already jogged to a suitable starting position, now we can activate the set surface command. And the set surface command is this one, this button here. You see that it has one line, which means that it's the first point of engagement vertically. One line, first point of engagement. We click on it. And you see here you have a confirmation of what tool that you are using for setting the surface. If the tool is one, as this, we simply click enter to confirm. And now, having this command active, we can, as in previous uh, tool calibration, we can simply hold zero to make it auto set. And having visually checked here that the magnet is in place, that the plate is correct, we can click and hold zero to do so. Very good, it said here, surface set. And now, this set value is important to take note of, because that set value is actually the set value in relation to the hard coordinates, the hard home of the machine. And should we, like uh, I think that we will, for this, this uh, set of toolpaths, run these, uh, these three toolpaths at two different dates. Then that means that uh, the CNC machine will be turned off at the end of the first day, of course. And that means that we will have to redo this again for the second day of running the toolpaths. And thus it is really important that you take note of this said value. Here it's minus 105.70. Given that we do the same set surface command with the same tool tomorrow, as long as we find this same value after having set the surface, we can be 100% confident that we have uh, found or set the same soft set zero position. So, take note of this value. We can do so on our notes here. So, set surface 
to number 1 was minus 105.7. Very good. Having set the surface, the next thing you should do is to set the maximum depth. The maximum depth with this button here, you see that it's got two lines, so it's the last point of engagement virtually. That sets at what said height the CNC machine will not go any deeper than, even if the toolpath says so. This is a necessary safety procedure to set a maximum depth, so that you make sure that should the toolpath be improperly authored, that you do not damage the machine bed, the tool or the spindle. To set the maximum depth, you can simply, in this case I think we have more room to the left, so we'll jog left here and make sure that this cable is not strained. Having jogged to the left here, we can position the same plate with the magnet still attached here, underneath, and jog down with the z-axis. Half back, let's see how many fingers. Yeah, a little down press. This is only to reduce the time it takes to auto set. Press that. Very good. And should we have set the maximum depth as this, then the maximum depth would actually be the machine bed surface. And this is a little unnecessary because if something has been improperly authored in terms of the toolpath bed values, then there should be no, no uh, risk of actually even touching the machine bed. And one thing to make sure of this is to go this uh, is placed here in the vacuum sealing strips box. This is just a thin, thin layer of tape, and even though 0.1 millimeter or whatever its uh, actual thickness would be, it does not, it is not a significant amount. But as you see, it's still, or perhaps not, but uh, I can see it here, that it still lifts the uh, the metal plate slightly slightly over the machine bed so that the maximum depth that we set is actually not co-aligned to the machine bed but slightly slightly over so I can instead of moving the plate I can just jog a little very good and then showing the CNC controller as well to set the maximum depth we click on this button, the two lines, the last point of engagement. We click on this, and you see a setting maximum depth, and you hold the zero. And visually checking that the magnet is still in place, and that the plate is correctly positioned. We just hold zero. And there we have found the maximum depth, or have set the maximum depth. Very good. I'll reposition the CNC controller to its holder here. And then having calibrated every tool that we intend to use, and having set the surface depth, and having set the maximum depth, we can remove this magnet, position it securely up here, very carefully, and then we can do the same for this one. Make sure that the magnets are below here. We slide it, it's easier than uh, vertically moving it. And this thin strip of tape we can relocate here as well. All right. The final step in terms of calibration or preparing here on the CNC machine bed at least is to set the actual work origin for the X and Y axis. We have already set the Z axis work origin, the Z0 for the work origin, because that is the same as the stock top, as the top surface of the stock. This is something we have also set 
uh, defined in Fusion 360. And this, this is why we also have set the work origin Z0 as such. But now we need to set the X and Y work origin. And the X and Y zero, it should be right here. So along this Z axis, of course, having already set the Z zero of this, we can we can set the X and Y as long as we are above this point in the X and Y axis. We can be here or we can be over here as long as we are right on top of that X and Y position. So like with the other commands, with the set service and the maximum depth, we can first jog before setting the actual home or the X and Y axis of, of the soft home or the work origin. So we'll jog a little to the right here. And until we are slightly uh, to the right of the material here. And then we can move here and jog here until we are slightly at the front there. Very good. And now we can jog down so to make it possible to evaluate with our eye here. So, and the reason for being a little outside here so is not to make any risk of colliding with the material instead. But if we make sure here that we are just slightly, slightly above it, then we know that now when jogging in the X and Y direction, we will not hit the material, but we will still be very close in terms of Z to the Z zero, to the top surface of the stock. All right, so now we position our eye, and here it is important to have only one eye, or only one eye open, so as to make sure that that we only see one line here and position our tool straight above that line. Now we can rotate it gently by doing like this. See the point where it is. Okay, very good. We'll try that. We can always reevaluate later. And then we we'll jog in this direction. One eye shot. Looks good. Let's evaluate from this side as well. Just slightly, slightly to the right. Slightly, slightly. Or actually, I am really satisfied with the position of it. Yes, I would say that this is our X and Y work origin, our X and Y soft hole. Very good. And now it is important because when we set this X and Y home, the X and Y values that we see here, those are relative to the actual hard home, to the machine bed, to the machine's own coordinates. But as soon as we set the home, this X and Y value these will be set, uh, reset as the soft home origin. And since we intend to mill separate tool paths during separate days, it is important to take note of this value as well. Like we previously uh, took uh, note of the Z value, not this Z value, but the value that was uh, after setting the surface. So either uh, photograph these as you did with these, or take note of them. Uh, you will have another chance while actually setting the home that we will do now. So being satisfied, satisfied with the position of the X and Y origin, we can click the shift button here to activate shift here. And then we can click the soft home button here. And now it asks you where, at what index to set your home. And index one is very good. Now you see there, there you saw the actual X and Y coordinates in terms of the machine's own coordinates, but now you'll see that they have been reset. So that is, that is important that uh, if you want to recover this work origin at a later date, at the day after, uh, you will need to 
take note of that uh, x and y values before or at the same moment as designing as defining that post. Very good, but we took note of them, so we can go and write them down. So, let's write these down. We have the uh, soft home of x plus 103.98 and y was 137.32 That means that when we at a later instance are trying to recover that uh, home we can simply jog to these exact coordinates having uh, of course uh, hard home the machine previously and then when setting the soft home we can jog to exact these coordinates and uh, set that even though the clearance tool part might have actually taken away that part of the, the, part of the material, uh, making it hard to determine in terms of uh, the actual stock left where the original X and Y uh, home was, but we can simply jog these values. Very good. We see here that the current active home is 1. We can have several homes, but only one home per tool path. So uh, I would suggest just leaving it at the home one. Uh, we can demonstrate uh, one nifty way of having several homes, just to make sure that you can uh, with ease and very quickly move the whole tool and the spindle and the whole y-axis to another direction, should you want. If we go up in z-axis in, in here, if we go up, jog up in z-axis, and then we jog away, and jog away in the y-axis as well and jog away in the y-axis as well very good then we can really very arbitrarily set that position as our home too which we will be not be using of course for the tool path but which we can use for quick and easy um, moving the uh, moving the whole uh, moving the tool away from the setup away from the stock so, like previously, we click Shift to activate the Shift, we press Home to set Home, and we can set this as our Home 2. And now this Home is set to Home 2, there, and now uh, the nifty way here is that you can now, without having clicked Shift, only with the Shift disabled here, you click only this button, and you can go to what Home, and you can go to Home 1. And I'll demonstrate this, click 1, it will retract and go to home 1. And now we can click that button again, the home button here, and click 2. And it will retract and go to home 2. That point will be arbitrarily set over there. The set position of the tool will always be in comparison or in relation to the surface. It will be precisely 100 millimeters above the surface that we have set here. But having experimented or demonstrated that, uh, we should make sure that the home is actually the home one that we previously set. So we'll click the home button, we'll hit one, we'll see that it moves to our set work origin. We're actually exactly 100 millimeters above our set XYZ zero. Very good. Having done so, make sure, having made sure that home equals 1 here, we can still jog away a little. This is something that I personally do as to give myself some time. When we execute the toolpath, it will go to the home, of course, to the home position. Uh, but if we jog away a little, like perhaps, uh, perhaps over there, that will give us some time to, if we need to adjust the feed rate or the spindle speed during the execution of the operation you can adjust the feed rate decrease the feed rate increase the feed rate maximum amount is always 100 percent though that is the value you set if you through 60 and you can decrease the spindle speed and increase the spindle speed and if you have uh, if you beforehand know that you're going to uh, 
adjust these values then it can be uh, soothing to the mind to know that you have this this extra distance here so that you can adjust the feed rates or the spindle speed during the uh, traveling from that point to the home instead of starting at the home and immediately engaging in the material that would give you a shorter time range to do such a feed rate or spinning speed manipulation <laughs>